Let us all stand up for the reading of God's word. We can read from the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 19, from verse 6 to verse 9. The book of Revelation, chapter 19, from verse 6 to verse 9. Let us all read together as a body of Christ with one voice and one accord. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns let us be glad and rejoice give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is a righteous acts of the saints then he said to me write blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb and he said to me these are the true sayings of god why don't we clap our hands and give god glory and praise as we start looking at his word this morning thank you may be seated we're going to see this morning about the great mystery of the ketubah because Jesus has revealed to us what will happen in the last days and what has been written in the Bible. The first manifestation of Christ as Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world and the rapture and the return of King Jesus matches with this. It is the ancient Jewish custom and tradition that was kept and the Bible speaks about it. Therefore, we look at it this morning. This is something that will take place in heaven. The Bible tells us that the Antichrist and the false prophet have been given 42 months in the book of Revelation chapter 13 verse 15. The authority to continue for that fixed period and time. We know that he prepares before that for in the middle of the week. After deceiving the people, speaking peaceably, he will suddenly turn and change. So 42 plus 42 would equal 7 years. This is the time that we saw the great tribulation will take place on earth. And this is also the time when the judgment of the wicked will take place. And after that, Jesus will return in a glorious, powerful manner as we saw last week. From heaven down to earth. To claim his rightful throne to be the king of all kings the Lord of all lords to be the master of this world and the universe and he'll rule and reign here for a thousand years but before that happened during that time when the Antichrist is here on earth and the church has been taken up in rapture there will be seven years of celebration that will happen in heaven the Jewish marriage custom for celebrating a marriage is a custom where they celebrate for seven days after the wedding you can see in genesis chapter 29 verse 27 about how there's a week's celebration for marriage that takes place and in that same pattern there are seven years that we who know jesus christ who follow him we who are the church of jesus christ who are born again who are baptized in water, who are baptized in the Holy Spirit and live a clear and a clean and a pure holy life, we will be taken up to be with Him so that we can be with Christ and celebrate at this time. Paul himself writes and the Bible tells us what God tells the church to be like. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 tells about how husbands ought to love their wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The relationship between Jesus Christ and the church is compared to the relationship between a husband and a wife. The relationship between God and man is compared to the relationship between a father and a son. Each and every one of you. Every one of you are the sons of God according to the word of God. Gender is just temporary and it is earthly for once you enter into the eternal realm. There is no need for procreation. Therefore, 
it does not matter what your gender is so do not let your gender contain you or limit you at any time fulfill the call of Christ in your life one such illusion is a marriage illusion how Christ the bridegroom will be united with the church which is here on earth and will be taken up this is the great mystery of Ketubah that Paul writes about in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 verse 31 and 32 he says for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh and he says this is a great mystery a deep secret truth and he says but I speak concerning Christ and the church this union this getting back together we are separated from our Lord from our God from our Savior from our King but when Jesus Christ comes in the clouds when he shouts then we will be united with him this is the deep secret that is the mystery of the ketubah which is the signing of the agreement there is a covenant that is entered at that time when the marriage takes place between the husband and the wife even now they follow it the list of things that are written down and signed by both who are involved with even two witnesses about what they will do as they get married and both their commitments and what they would offer and what they can expect the same way Christ has given us the everlasting covenant and he will keep it his covenant is with you when we took the holy communion Jesus says this is the blood of the new covenant the new agreement he shed his blood and he sealed that covenant between you and him and he keeps that covenant this is a great deep secret of the ketubah, the signing, the getting back together. There are many mysteries that are revealed to you as a child of God in the kingdom of God. Jesus himself says to each and every one of you it has been given that you might know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But those who are outside, all things come in parables why in mark chapter 4 verse 12 the next verse he says so that seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear and not understand lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them because of their pride they did not take a step towards god each and every one of you have come this morning you've taken a step unto him jesus says draw nigh unto me and i'll draw nigh unto you if you come to me i will no wise cast you out when you take the first step no man might notice but God notices when you make your way here to the house of God no one in this world might know that you're here even the people in the church might miss you out you might come in and go back without seeing anybody you might think no one has noticed but I tell you God notices and because you take that step and you took that step this morning to come to Jesus he will come and he will bless you you will not go back the same you will not go back empty-handed you will not go back without a revelation you will have your eyes open you will be taken up higher but those who think there isn't anything for them to receive they stay back at home and they miss out on this that is why this is a mystery that they do not know a secret that they do not understand because of their pride they think they know everything they figure it out they understand it all what is there Sometimes even Christians come once in a way because they think there isn't much that God can give. There isn't much that his church can do for them. And they are mistaken because they will not be able to break through in this life and also into the next, which is much more important. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11 verse 25, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent He's telling it cynically. He's telling about those who think they're wise in their own eyes. Those who are smart according to the ways of the world and those who have the mental strength who might have got many certificates but they fail to understand the most important truth, the most important knowledge that they need to have, the most important 
wisdom that they need to have is that there is a God who created heaven and earth and that he is the one who created man and when they surrender their lives he will save them no man can make heaven there is not one man on earth who's cheated death death comes knocking on everyone's door what will the wise do what will the rich do what will the kings and the leaders of the world do when one day death comes knocking at your door is there anyone who's lived is there anyone who's alive now who's more than 120 years old no one what would you do at that time all the money cannot save you all the recognition cannot save you all your power all your wealth and your fame can do nothing at that time there is only one who can save and his name is jesus that is why we surrender our lives we are not fools to come this morning and sit and stand here and shout and scream and get excited about our god we are the wise in the world for fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom because we are planning and we are preparing for eternity that is there after this but for that it all starts by taking a single step towards god you've got to make that effort every day of your life set up a time you got to enter into that place where you meet with him where you set aside everything else and when the time comes for the service whichever day of the week it would be you take the step to be here and god notices moses one of the greatest deliverers on earth was looking after sheep in the wilderness and suddenly he saw this bush burning and he looked at it and he turned away and he was walking and he noticed that even after some time it was still burning so as he kept on looking at it he could see that it was not burnt up it still looked lively and fine and well but it was still on fire and that is why he left his flock behind his job his work his assignment behind he took the step of faith to go towards that burning bush he climbed up that mountain at that age of 80 he didn't say what if i trip and fall this is not my age to climb a mountain i've seen all in my life he was the prince of the most powerful nation of the world having held the highest office being a general being taught in all the wisdom and having all the knowledge of the most advanced civilization at that time but still he wanted to go and approach that burning bush because he knew that it was something different and when he got near that's when god started speaking to him and the call of his life became true from that moment onwards it was from that moment when he had that encounter with god that he started living and fulfilling the plan of god for his life god set him on a mission that changed the world how did it all start because he took a step the first time he saw the bush burning god didn't speak you know after a few minutes few hours god didn't speak only when he got near he had to take that step you got to take that step in your life you know that something is happening you're aware that there is a meeting place with god you got to get into that meeting place and as you go there in here with no assurance with no confirmation written and given to you you come and you approach and you wait and god will speak for he is a god who speaks he's a god who has mercy and compassion on you he will fix your life it doesn't matter which state you are in where you are in he will set you on the right path he'll set you on a mission the call of god in your life the reason for which you were created each and every one of you have an important part in the kingdom of god that's why he walked into your life he spoke and called you by name and he wrote your name in the lamb's book of life because he has an assignment he has a project for you and he will tell you and you got to meet on a regular basis as moses did and he will tell you and he will guide you step by step this is one of the greatest mysteries of the kingdom of god because people just look and hear and not give their time and their focus and their attention and they walk away they know about jesus they know 
that he is someone who's done some miracles. They know that many Christians say they have received miracles and deliverance. They know supernatural things have happened to those who follow Jesus, but they cancel it. They do not come and investigate. They do not come near to really dig deep and see whether it is true or not. They cast it aside saying, nah, I don't have time for this. I have an important job. I cannot climb up. I can't take the effort. I can't set aside. And that's how they miss because they think they have it all. They don't need God. They're wise in their own eyes. But hell will open the eyes of everyone. All those who are blind now, all those who are proud now will one day know the truth, but it will be too late. That is why I'm talking to you this morning so that you'd make the decision now. The Jewish wedding had two stages. The Krishnu and the Nishun. The Kiddushin was the first step, a process of sanctification dedication it was what we would call now a betrothal or an engagement the bible tells about mary being betrothed to joseph in matthew chapter 1 verse 18 this is a time both of them someone who's decided to be the husband and wife the bridegroom and the bride come together with their families and they decide and they say okay we're going to get married but before the marriage happens they come and make an agreement with each other because the Bible is a book which is thousands of years old you got to understand back in those days they didn't have any electronic communication available therefore the bridegroom would come to the house of the bride-to-be and they will come and meet up and they will say we will get married and one of the first steps that happens is as he comes, the bridegroom comes to the bride's house, he'll come with gifts for the bride. You can see that happening in the life of Isaac and Abraham in Genesis chapter 24 verse 10. It tells that the servant of Abraham took 10 of his master's camels. All he needs is one for him to go. Why did he take 10? Because he was taking gifts. He was taking valuable treasures so that when he meets the one who would be the bride for his master's son, he would give that sealing that commitment, sealing that intent, giving that gift saying, I am serious about this. We live in a nation where it seems to be completely opposite to what happened in the Bible. That they had to even come up with a law, a law to, law to protect so that no one is forced to give dowry. And here it is, the bride who is forced to give dowry to the groom but not in the church but it can happen outside but in the Bible it is the bridegroom who gives the gifts it is not a compulsion but they come and they give precious things see what Abraham had sent Genesis chapter 24 verse 22 it tells that when he first saw the girl the bride to be he gave her a golden nose ring weighing about half a shekel and two bracelets for a wrist weighing 10 shekels of gold that was the very first step and so now she takes him Rebecca takes him and they go to the house he meets the parents he even gives gifts to the parents and then it says again he gives them all gifts it says in verse 53 Genesis chapter 24 the servant brought out jewelry of silver jewelry of gold and clothing and he gave them to Rebecca he also gave precious things to a brother and to a mother. So he came with 10 camels so they can give gifts to all of them to prove and show that he was serious about this and so that they will know that he is capable, that he is able to be able to have this married life. That's the first thing that happens at the engagement or the betrothal or the kiddushin. But there is also another thing that happens in a situation where, like in the life of Ruth, Naomi, her mother-in-law, lost her husband, Elimelech, and her two sons, Cleon and Megillion. And so here, the land that they had was now in need of redemption. And so 
the groom is the one who has to redeem the bride Ruth chapter 4 verse 6 it says you redeem my right of redemption for yourself for I cannot redeem it this is one of the closest relative of Ruth who's speaking and telling to Boaz because he's supposed to be the one the closest relative is the one who's supposed to pay and redeem the land and be able to marry Ruth and take care of Naomi but he says I cannot redeem it and so Boaz steps up at that time and he has the finance and the money and he has the ability to redeem it Ruth chapter 4 verse 9 10 it says about how Boaz said to the elders and all the people you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech and all that was Kilion and Melon from the hand of Naomi and moreover Ruth the Moabites, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. This is what Boaz did for Ruth and Naomi. This book, the book of Ruth, tells how the Gentile church is added to Jesus Christ. We lost everything. We went after the world as Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, lost everything, just like how Naomi lost her husband. They went seeking prosperity and wealth, and she came back empty-handed. Both her sons also died there. She came back with great distress and great sorrow and pain. But Boaz is a type of Christ, the kinsman redeemer, who steps up, who says, I'll take care of you, I'll buy what is yours, I'll redeem it. That which was lost, just like how Jesus has redeemed each and every one of you and the Gentile bride, the church. Because the church was not able to save itself. We were not able to save ourselves. The blood of goats and of animals cannot cleanse our sins. There is no sacrifice that we can perform and give where we will be acceptable unto God. We cannot make our way into heaven. God is the one who has to come from heaven down to earth. We cannot sit under a tree and have our eyes open suddenly one day and attain enlightenment. Jesus, the light of the world, is the one who is to shine your, his light upon us. He's the one who expels the darkness. He's the one who can take us up to heaven. Man cannot save himself. There are no works. You cannot climb any mountain to get yourself saved. You cannot dip yourself in any water of any sea or river or lake. You cannot roll on the ground oh, from here to any holy man-made place to get salvation. There is one name that saves. There is one person who saves and that is Jesus Christ. For there is no other name given among men by which men may be saved except the name of Jesus. God gave his son Jesus to redeem you. Galatians chapter 4 verse 3 onwards it tells about this saying. Even so we when we were children we are in bondage under the elements of the world. God sent forth his son to redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. You are the sons of God. Say, I'm a son of God. Everybody shout out and say, I'm a son of God. Jesus himself gave his own life to redeem you. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 and 14 it says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. That's what Jesus did. He took us from the world, from the pressures of the elements of the world which kept us in bondage he redeemed us from the devil who said we belong to him that we deserve hell and death but jesus came and paid the price galatians chapter 3 verse 13 and 14 the bible says christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. 
Boaz could just pay and redeem, but we could not be redeemed by any amount of money, gold or silver. Jesus had to give his life to redeem us. And he redeemed us and he became a curse. He took the curse that was supposed to be upon us and he put it upon himself and that's how he removed it. And he paid the price for it so that you can instead receive the blessing of Abraham. We were not the children of Abraham, but now through Jesus Christ we receive the blessing of Abraham and have become the children of Abraham. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18 tells that Jesus redeemed you with his own precious blood, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct. Why don't you all shout out and say aimless conduct is not what I follow anymore in my life. That's what people of the world are caught up in. That's why they run here and there. They are under pressure. You are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He paid with his own blood, the precious blood, the only blood that is precious. There is no other blood that could pay the price. And when he redeemed you, just like how in the ancient Jewish wedding at the Kiddushin, the time of the engagement, they give gifts just as how Boaz redeemed Ruth after redeeming the church at the cross with his own blood by becoming the curse Jesus then the Bible says gave gifts unto men and Acts chapter 2 verse 30, 37 says this when they heard the message of Peter at that time when the first service of the church took place and when they heard the gospel, they were cut to their heart and they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? That is how we approach Christ. That's how we approach the Bible. Lord, what shall we do? Teach us, show us, tell us. At that time, Peter, verse 38, answers and says, repent, one. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, two. Why? For the remission of sins. So that you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Three. How can your sins be forgiven? He says repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what verse 38 says. He doesn't say repent and your sins will be forgiven. He says repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of sins and when... All your sins are cleansed. You're holy and you're pure and you're clean. And each and every one of you who are baptized in water, you are the perfect candidate to receive the very Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside of you. There is nothing more that you need. All you need is hunger and faith. Ask God and He will give you. His Holy Spirit will come and dwell and lead you. You don't have to understand all you have to do is ask and you will receive. You didn't understand too much when you got born again. You didn't understand too much when you were baptized in water. All you knew was that you needed it and it was essential and important. You knew it very clearly and that's why I took it. And we spend our whole life understanding the depths and the heights and the love of Christ and of His salvation and His redemption. All of eternity we will enjoy and get to know it more and more. You don't have to do any religious act apart from being born again and being baptized in water to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Get into the word of God. Read the book of Acts. See what happened in the early church. Do your homework. Then you'll understand as you feed yourself with the word of God. 
then you will be able to understand before you set on a new project or a new assignment i'm sure they give you manuals for which you have to read before you start on a project there is a briefing you're told about the requirements you're told about what the target is you're told all the details about the project that they place you in at your work you know your job description they tell it at the interview what you're supposed to do what is expected of you what are the deliverables what you're supposed to do each and every day and you read it and you go through it you understand it and then you get into it you might have never done a project like that doesn't mean that you cannot do it you take a step of faith in the same way do your homework get the manual that god wrote and gave it to you and read from the new testament read the four gospels read the acts of the apostles and continue reading with hunger saying oh lord i heard and i've read and i know that everyone in the church the 120 were baptized in the holy spirit not one of them were left out everyone who were there they received so each and every one of you are the ideal candidate you're perfect to receive do not postpone do not delay then you will be able to live in that supernatural realm you will have the very power of god the power that jesus christ had that he could make blind eyes see with just a prayer with just a touch with just a statement from his mouth he could make the deaf ears hear you could lift up those who are crippled and paralyzed he even raised the dead and that same power the same holy spirit with which jesus operated in oh is inside of each and every one of you and that is the gift that jesus gave just like how <coughs> when the bridegroom comes he gives valuable gifts as we saw jesus came and gave us one of the most important things that we would ever need the very spirit of god that was the problem with man he could not fix himself man could not save himself man could not break free from the compulsions of the world and the flesh he needed the power of god he need the transformational power of the holy spirit and that is why jesus came and gave the holy spirit as a gift freely not only is the holy spirit given as a gift the holy spirit himself acts like the eliezer who went to give the gifts that rebecca needed so that she could prepare herself and now jesus and the holy spirit are given gifts to each and every one of you they are innumerable you know the gifts of the spirit that are given to the church the word of wisdom the word of knowledge understanding that is supernatural been given to you gift of faith gifts of healing gift of discerning of spirit he gave you the gift of prophecy he has given you the gift of diverse tongues all that has been given there are so many that god has given there is a limitless supply of gifts he is not limited there is not nothing that you lack that you cannot achieve so that you can fulfill the call of god in your life he has given you all that you need if they put you on a project where you need a computer in your office to work on that project and fulfill that assignment they would give you the computer how can they expect you to do the job without giving you all that you need they'll give you the training they give you all the equipment you would need if you are working in a manufacturing company and they make cars they will give you all the raw materials that you would need the same way god has given all that is needed for the church and all that is needed in the life of every believer so that they can shine bright in the darkness ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 tells about how jesus and the holy spirit gave gifts to you to each and every one of you it says here therefore he says when he ascended on high and he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men just like how abraham sent gifts 10 camels full of gifts to rebecca jesus and the holy spirit have come and they've given gifts to us 
Why don't you all shout out and say, God has given me gifts. And some of these are written from verse 11. It says, and he gave, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These are the gifts, though they might be people that God uses when he calls them and when he appoints them and he anoints them, they become a supernatural gift in the hand of God. They're the gift given to the church so that the needs of the church can be met by those who are appointed over the church. That's why it says that he himself gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints. Just like how you need a computer to do your job, you need the raw material, you need all the other equipment to get your work done. God has given these who are chosen vessels of God to be the gifts for the church and for the saints, for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? So that all these can be used in each and every one of your lives. In verse 13 it says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. They've all been given so that they can teach you, lead you, guide you, show you and lift you up so that you can become full in the knowledge of God to be a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the target. To be like how Jesus Christ was. God has given gifts so that you can be shaped and molded. So that you can be led and built up. So that you can come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? That we should no longer be children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. That's why you've got to know who are the gifts and you've got to be careful to receive from those who've been ordained by God, who have the anointing of God and the presence of God. Ephesians 4.15, the next way he says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joint and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working of by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. As you're connected, you'll receive the power, you'll receive the life, you'll receive all that you need for God will give it to his gifts to those whom he's appointed the things that you would need and you'll be able to receive in turn God is preparing his bride that's what he's doing with these gifts who's, who are there operating on earth he's preparing and equipping each and every one of you so that you can be prepared just like how Esther was prepared before she could marry the king the book of Esther chapter 2 verse 9 it says that when she was chosen and found favor the one who took care of her lost no time in getting her ready. The Holy Spirit lost no time. He is waiting. Some people say, oh, I'm waiting for God. I'm waiting. He's the one who's been waiting for 2,000 years. You've got to come to the point of meeting him. He lo loses no time. He is always ready. You've got to get yourself and come to that place and surrender yourself and be willing and listen to him. She left behind her family and Esther went in to that separated place. You've got to leave behind certain things when you want to follow the Lord Jesus. The apostles and the disciples forsook everything. So that they could be with the Lord Jesus night and day so that they can learn and be transformed. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God and expect a transformation. Because the influence of the world will corrupt what God has invested in you. Come away, separate yourself. Do not let that unclean thing defile you. What association has Christ with Belial? What association has light with darkness? When we sanctify ourselves, then we will receive the teaching that we need. We will receive the power that we need. And Esther was taken, it says here in Esther chapter 2 verse 9, He lost no time in beginning her beauty treatment 
of massage and special diet. He gave her the best place there, assigned seven young women specially chosen from the royal palace to serve her. That's how Jesus is preparing. That's how the Holy Spirit is preparing the bride, the church. That's how he's preparing you. Just like how Esther was prepared. And what was this treatment? It says in Esther chapter 2 verse 12, the regular beauty treatment for the women lasted a year. You can go for a one hour of beauty treatment and be short of and taken out of your pocket 5,000 bucks. But here for a whole year, she gave, she was receiving beauty treatment. And there were seven women taking care of her. One must have been doing a manicure, one a pedicure, one must be doing the hair, one must be taking care of facial treatment and obviously there must have been two cut up pieces of cucumber put on her eyes so she cannot see to eat. So all she has to do is open her mouth and one of the seven was feeding her and she was lying down and eating. The other was preparing the special diet. God is taking care of every part of your life. Those who are yielded and those who surrender, they will receive from Him. Revelation 19.5, the verse we read, it says, And it was granted, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What is happening at this time as we are getting ready? What happens in the Jewish wedding after the betrothal, after the engagement, after the kirushin, after the bridegroom comes with the family and gives gold gifts and precious articles and clothing and gives all that is needed so that the bride can prepare herself and get ready. And at the time he goes back and he prepares a place in his father's house. Most of the time he prepares another room, he gets it built up. That's why it might take approximately a year or so. And he prepares and puts all the furniture, gets everything in order and sets up the things. So that then when everything is ready, he can come back. And take the bride in marriage. That's what Jesus is, is doing right now. John chapter 14 verse 2 and 3 and 4. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. He's going, gone back to heaven to prepare a place for you. He says in verse 3, John chapter 14, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is the great mystery of the Ketubah, how God came and He gave us gifts and how He's preparing us and equipping us so that he can take us to the place that he is preparing there on top. And the first step of the marriage ceremony is over. The second part is the Nisuin, where the marriage really takes place. Where the bridegroom and the bride come together. Jesus will come and he will return for the church. We know First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and 17. Weren't you all read it aloud along with me where it says for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. He will come with a shout. That's what happens. There are no forms of communication. They don't have social media. They don't have a telephone where the bridegroom can call up and say, Oh, I'm coming tomorrow. I'm coming in a month's time. The bride will be just waiting. She wouldn't know when he's going to come, when he's got everything organized and ready. He might have gone to a far place, to the other side of the country. There is no way of communicating. She'll be prepared and ready every day. Because suddenly if the bridegroom comes and she is not ready, then it means that she is not prepared and she is not done what is right. We the church have to be ready each and every day of our life because you do not know when the bridegroom is going to come. But before the bridegroom comes, oh in the distance, 
the bride will hear she will hear even as she is there in the house waiting eagerly prepared and equipping herself that suddenly there's loud music oh there's a celebration of music party comes first in the same way jesus will send his angels and the trumpet of god will sound suddenly one day and then the bridegroom will come and then we who are ready at that time will be taken up this is what happens in a jewish wedding the nisuin an unexpected sudden call revelation 19:7 says for the marriage of the lamb has come all this is possible because your jesus reigns if he doesn't reign he will not be able to make this happen no man on earth is in control all the powerful leaders of the world cannot give an assurance all the great minds of the world are not able to give the solution to the problems of the world they just hope that there will be a solution they are just saying at this time that will happen this vaccination should come and then this should resolve it but no one is giving 100% assurance that's how the state of man is but god when he says something he has the power to do it because he reigns he is the true ruler he is the true king he is the one who alone is worthy to sit on the throne over the men of the world he is the one who can rule over the world and all that is there in it revelation 19:6 it says and i heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying alleluia for the lord god all omnipotent reigns he reigns the omnipotent god reigns oh i've come this morning to tell you i've got to also come do not assume that because the church is there i'll be here by default by the grace of god i'm here this morning alive and well there are many who are pastors who are not there the last 6 months i could be buried 6 feet under so don't assume that every sunday everything is going to be fine and normal i'm not saying something bad is going to happen but it is purely the grace of god you got to hold each other in prayer but i've come this morning by the power of god the grace of god the mercy of god and the compassion of god to tell you that your god reigns as your 52:7 says how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who proclaims peace who brings glad tidings of good things who proclaims salvation who says to zion your god reigns do not be shaken up do not be in doubt don't let your faith waver know your god reigns he will do all that is needed for you all you have to do is there are three things that you have to choose to do that's what this portion of the bible says that we read in revelation chapter 19 verse 7 it says first let us be glad when god reigns we can be glad we need to be glad you got to be glad each and every day of your life for there is righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit the fruit of the spirit is love which has joy and peace and goodness and kindness which has long suffering which is got faithfulness in it which has got self control in it if you have the holy spirit in you he is the lord and god and if you have put on christ if the holy spirit is dwelling inside of you then definitely you will have love overflowing you will have joy in your life at any time you're continuously irritated for the whole day and a few days you're just you lost it and you're walking up and down pacing like a caged tiger ready to rip apart the people anyone who dare come near you then definitely the holy spirit is not in control of you you not yielded yourself to him you not crucified your flesh with christ saying it's no longer i who live but christ who lives in me you cannot have anger and rage and it consume me all the day and all the days of your life you got to make the choice to be glad especially in this situation 
in the world there are so many things that can affect you and steal your joy and your gladness someone can come and say something you can just think about it you can see the things happening all around and it can steal your gladness but you got to make the choice that's why it says let us be glad let us make the decision let us take the choice every morning make the choice yes all of us get hit by the fiery darts of the evil one who tries to put away the joy and the gladness that we have but you got to immediately get back that gladness from god and especially when we come to the house of god we've got to come with a glad heart the moment you set your foot in forget all your troubles for you don't have any trouble all you need is faith in god i tell you you don't have any trouble there is no trouble those are the words of jesus christ himself you have no trouble all you need is faith in god say that why don't we all say it saying i have no trouble all i need is faith in god psalm 102 it says 100 verse 2 serve the lord with gladness come before his presence with singing there's no point of serving god without gladness we know now how when we go to buy something or eat somewhere or purchase something that whoever is selling it whoever is the person who is interacting with us on behalf of that company as you make a call as you chat with them online to get some certain services from them they have to serve you with gladness they cannot be irritated with you because they had a bad customer before they met you you will not accept it you expect them to treat you with gladness you expect them to smile at you you expect them to be nice to you how much more should we serve god each and every one of you come to the house of god to serve god and you got to serve him with gladness you cannot serve him with a long face you cannot serve him with irritation you cannot serve him with a dull attitude you got to forget everything and leave everything aside nehemiah knew how he need to serve the king you've come not just to serve somebody another customer of the world another human being you've come to serve the king of kings and the lord of lords give with a cheerful heart whatever you give unto your god your praise your worship your singing your clapping of hands your standing you sitting here in the house of god let it be given cheerfully for god loves a cheerful giver nehemiah knew how to give he says in nehemiah chapter 2 was one now i have never been sad in his presence before he was the one who was serving the king at xerxes at that time and he knew how important it was he had to go there and he had to be presentable he had to go there and he had to be with gladness the king cannot look at him and see a scowl on his face second verse he says but he was sad and suddenly at that time so much so that the king said why is your face sad since you are not sick how many here are sick then you can say okay i am sad if you're not sick why are you sad that's what the king is asking as soon as the king asked it, he says so i became dreadfully afraid he knew he had crossed the line he knew that now he was in that danger zone he's not just going to get fired the head might roll we are talking about a kingdom of an empire of an emperor before whom people tremble what they say and what they do is law and he was nothing but a captive a slave taken from another country to serve the king he dare not be sad when he serves the king in front of him he's got to go there and be presentable he has to be professional he has to know you wouldn't do that in your office every day go and say oh i don't feel like go and complain to the boss every day or today i have a headache and the next day you go today i have a stomach pain then third day you go today i have a knee pain and the fourth day you go and say i'm not feeling fine 
and the fifth day you go and say, oh, it's very cloudy, I don't feel like it today. Then after that, the sixth day, you won't be called. You go, you buckle it up, you swallow it, you go there and you present yourself in a professional fashion and manner. We've got to serve, we've got to choose to be glad. There will always be in this fallen world a reason for us to be sad. But we've got to make the choice to look at the sun, the son of God. We've got to look at the light that is shining on us. We've got to focus on his word and on his promises and all the blessings of God. You've got to count them one by one. And you've got to choose to rejoice. Revelation 19 verse 7 says, let us rejoice. Psalm 100 verse 1, it says, make a joyful shout. The King James Version says, make a joyful noise. That cannot be done unless first the gladness is there. That's the beginning continuous state of your mind and your heart. And from there, you get excited. When you start thinking and when you start dwelling in His presence, you're glad and you do many things in the world. You come here and you're glad. And then as you hear more and more about your God and as you think more and more about Him, as He touches you, you feel His presence. Oh, and you get His revelation. Then you're so excited that you give out a loud shout. There is a noise. That's why in our country, during a particular festival, they just burst crackers. It's nothing but noise. But for them, it's a celebration because they're so happy and excited. But there is no noise in the house of God. Everyone's very quiet. No one is celebrating. We walk in quietly and walk out quietly. Because we have not made the choice to rejoice. Habakkuk 3, 17. Turn and read it along with me. Verse 17, verse 18. Habakkuk, or read it from what is displayed to you. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the wine, though the labor of the olive may fall, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Let this be true in your life if you're facing difficulty. For as you rejoice, you're unlocking the power of God into your life. As you rejoice, you will receive. The situation will change. For God says unto each and every one of you, Isaiah chapter 62 verse 4 and 5, you shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land anymore be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hepzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord delights in you and you shall be married. The Lord delights in each and every one of you. Why don't you turn to someone beside you, behind you and point to them and say, the Lord delights in you. Tell to people all around, not just one side so that no one is left out. Tell them the Lord delights in you. The Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. God will take care of everything that concerns you. He is going to take responsibility just like how Boaz redeemed all the land that belonged to Naomi and Ruth and there was no one to take care of it. He redeemed it so that he can work in it. It would have been a wild place but he would have cleared it up and then he would have planted, he would have sown and then he would have started reaping. Then he would have had a profit in that. In the same way, God is going to turn the waste places into your life or into a fertile ground where you will have great profit, you will flourish and you will grow. Because God is going to take care of all that belongs to you. He is a God who has made a covenant with you to be with you. Choose to be glad. Choose to rejoice. Choose to give God glory. That's all you have to do. Let us give him glory. For he has already done mighty things at the cross. He has done mighty t things as he rose again from the tomb. Jesus will look at every service at every day and see who is giving him glory. There were 10 lepers when he went to a certain village and they all lifted up their voice saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. The Bible says, so when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourself to the priests. And so as it were, as they went, they were cleansed. Even as they were walking towards the priest, 
but only one of them when he saw that he was healed returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at the feet of Jesus giving him thanks and he was a Samaritan the Bible says he was not even a Jew but he knew what was right to be done unto Jesus Christ at that time Luke chapter 17 verse 17 Jesus says so Jesus answered and said were there not ten cleansed but where are the nine Verse 13, he says, Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Where are all those who call themselves to be the members of this church? Were there not so many? He knows the number. There was, he's the one who's brought each and every one of you here. He will ask, Where are the others? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God? That is how he return every time we meet here to give him glory. For he's already done awesome and wonderful things. How many here can say, God has healed me, clap your hands. How many here can say, God has delivered me in the past. How many here can say, God has done miracles in my life. Clap your hands and give him glory. For there is none like him, there is no one like him. Oh, you are blessed for your call to the celebration. Oh, let us stand up at this time. You are blessed for your call to this marriage supper. The marriage celebration, the greatest party ever that will ever take place seven years according to earth's calculation but eternity is completely different you're not just called to the marriage but to the supper which will take place after the marriage as jesus meets the church then he's united we are united with him and then starts the celebration there in heaven for seven years and you are blessed for god has called you if there's any place that you've got to be it is in that place at that time if there's any celebration you need to be part of you've got to be a part of that i tell you you will have wonderful things to eat which you have never eaten all your life you'll have wonderful things to taste of which you've never tasted in your life and you'll have all of eternity to enjoy each and every one of it it'll be a big banquet and a feast there'll be music there'll be singing there'll be dancing Oh, there will be wonderful celebration which you would have never seen. This is the ketubah that you are part of and it has been written and given to you in his word. That he will come back for his church. That's why he says in Revelation 19.9, write. For these are the true sayings of God. He has written and he will perform it. He will do it. Oh, thank you God. Thank you, Father, for you've kept your word and you've done all these things in our life. We come to you even this morning. We praise you. We worship you. Oh, we celebrate. We sing of your goodness. We give you mercy, oh Lord. Oh, thank you for your mercy. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. Oh, Holy Father, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, we exalt you, Lord. Oh, we count our blessings. We choose to be glad. We choose to rejoice this morning once again in your house, in your presence. For the God who turns the water into wine. For the God who opens the eyes of the blind. For there is no one like you, Lord. For into this dark world you shine and you shine in our lives. Your word is uplifting your word. Oh, is a lamp. Oh, unto our feet and a light unto our path. Oh, water you turned into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine And out of the ashes we rise For no one like you And none like you Once again we're going to say Into the darkness you shine Everybody say out of the ashes And out of the ashes we rise for no one like you 
none like him Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and power Our God Our God Oh clap your hands shine his light each and every day pray that all your needs be met that there'll be more than what you would want in your life oh that there'll be abundance and overflowing that your maker your creator oh let him create all that you need and give you oh let him lead you and guide you throughout this week and cover you with his blood and with his name bless you once again in the name of the father the name of the son the name of the holy spirit Oh, in Jesus' mighty name, clap your hands and give God glory, give Him praise, give Him honor, give Him power. Pray each and every day for the following Sunday service. Be here. Plan to be here by 7.30. God will do wonderful things in your life. God bless you.